Um, I have a couple of poems, I think about 10. I'm gonna shoot for about 20 minutes, does that sound about right? Um, when I was trying to decide what to read tonight, um, I had that, the syndrome of, the, the, I have nothing to wear syndrome, when you open your closet full of clothing and go, I have nothing to wear. And I'm like, silly, put on clothes and go, and it'll be okay. So I just started pulling poems that reminded me of things. So I have poems that have a couple of recent obsessions, um, including um, elephants, always something good to obsess over, um, feet, a lifelong obsession, um, and uh, grammar in particular, I'm really interested in words that can function as multiple parts of speech. Um, I started working on a series of poems um, that, as Calvin and Hobbes <laughs> would say, um, tried to verb their things, um, that tried to use those parts of speech in different ways, or at least inspired um, poems that came out of that idea of what if you could um, to poem, you know, you, you can run or you can go for a run, but you cannot poem. Apparently you have to write one, and I wanted it to be a verb, you know, so why not? Um, so this first one uh, is really mostly about the activity of writing a poem and what, you know, what, what drives us to write these things or what is this sort of um, quasi-existential crisis that drives us to try to put things into words even though we know that those words will never be good enough. So this is called, When My Dog Puts. This may take a very long time. It will require patience and judici judicious choices. Opportunities will come to challenge us. Opportunities will leave before they've been announced. A moth doesn't flutter an unlit candle. What can you say then about burned or burnt? It is most important to know the difference flame and oxygen, times of smoke and light, and sleep and ember, the liver, soul seat, rests. <coughs> I will stop when my dog puts his head in my lap, when this man puts his head on my lap, when I put my head on my own lap. I will not stop when my head starts to lap up its own lapping, a sound of running water, ripples cross, recrossing a light table of liquid and equations. What is this all for but to feel a moment more intently than we could before? To be in being more with more? To be the sober atheist at the lip of the mind, looking down the throat of it all, saying, my God, my God, how can I see at all? To be sober and undone, godless and so rich with faith, it runs down the soft ears and muzzle of my life. Um, this next one is a very, very nerdy poem um, that is inspired by uh, my attempt to teach the Epic of Gilgamesh to eighth graders, um, which is a very, very old story written on uh, tablets that have been broken and recomposed. And so the effect is that there is a lot of repetition and there's a lot of really cool language, including um, these, these words that I think they're called kennings. They're when two words have been mushed together um, with a hyphen usually, like in the Old Testament, it comes through as loving kindness, um, all one word. Uh, and then Gilgamesh, it shows up as oftentimes emotion words, and so <laughs> he'll speak of um, woe fear. I'm like, yes, that's what I was feeling this morning. I was feeling the woe fear. Um, so the story of Gilgamesh is that uh, he is this kind of irresponsible king who um, is very, very powerful, but also kind of a gigantic jerk. And so the gods send down um, his rival and equal, who um, they fight for seven nights, and then they're the best of friends, and maybe something more. And then um, his best friend, Enkidu, dies, forcing Gilgamesh to come to terms with his mortality. And Gilgamesh does not want to come to terms with the fact that he may die. So he goes in search of um, a, 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 the key to immortality. But he is so distraught by the death of his friend that he clutches his body to him um, and won't let go of his friend until a worm falls out of his nose. Which I was like, yes! All right, so this is called Vital Signs. There is no limit for my love for you. 
There is no limit to my love. There is no limit for my fear for you. There is no limit to my fear. There is no limit to woe love for fear. There is no love without woe fear. Poor Gilgamesh, heroic ass of a man who lost the key to immortality while taking a bath. What had he just remained unclean in the muck with the rest of us? We can't all hold our loved ones till a worm falls from their nose. We can't all hold our loved ones and incubate the woe, grow it like a fungus, like a mold in our vitals, through the stomach lining, up the lungs, across the spleen, until it eats through the esophagus and steals our voices, clouds our vision, plugs our ears until we cannot hear or see or feel anything but fear and fear. And why, dear Gil, and can I call you that? Why, when the worm fell out of your dead love's nose, why then did you let go? Mm -hmm. um, this is the one that uh, I call um, poem parentheses V for verb, um, for I wish it was an activity that was a little bit more practical. For the feel of it, the mind going wide like a pupil in the dark for the soft compression of the elephant's sweet foot as it puffs and settles peace into the dust. There is a keenness here, along with the flattening, the hush of dilation. Look, the black center of things has gone hazel at the edge of all this blue. Look how close the air feels in all of this. Oh is the perfect word. Oh, into the openness, into the blur of boundary, an orifice, an eye, the blue, the black of it. How shockingly vulnerable we make ourselves by seeing. Is that why, and then because, for all and beauty? Oh, into the hush of having placed sweet foot, each thick pad, grace and bear the weight, at rest in this. Your greatest strain is simply being still, and each sweet foot with toenails so improbable they hurt my heart with wonder. <laughs> oh, for all the hills that look like you, for all the feet that look like hills, for all the desert emptiness so full of heart and hill and look like you, and you forever in the moment, transferring still in motion, but without effort, not yet bearing the weight. A foot about to be a foot, after the stop, the swing and the purpose of all this. Dear open desert now in the darkness, open now and now and now. Of course, I know you are always open, even when the darkness presses too close to be anything but in myself. There is no better word for desert. Sweet in this rich darkness, I would name you octagon or elephant in solitude, devour. Devour. Only because you are so near and being near, we cannot help but to confuse. It is not eating, but what else can we call it if not what it isn't? Another name, continue. A feeling of water and we, such creatures of oil and skin, pores that miracle, don't let the water in. Sweet slipper, my skin, even you, open. If only I could make a word for love. Never have we kept been so close as we are when we know we cannot name it. Hush, here comes the darkness, and with it comes our all and offerings. Oh, into the margin, sweet, you are the bones, sun cleaned, unearthing. Sweet bones, you are the bones, so oh, into your opening. Even when then nothing happens, oh, my heart, my heart. Even then, I am too rich with it to speak more than to say, Oh, my heart, you widen like the gentle foot of some soft giant come through the dust, come through. Because elephants know loss. Because elephants can laugh. Because we are not the only ones who dance and bury our dead. It's true. Elephants dance. They're so cool. Um, and they bury their dead. Um, This is another, um, 
This one's a shift in tone. Um, it's another kind of long poem, but it, uh, it reads fairly fast. It's a, um, it's a commentary on uh, my, uh, how much I hate the word purse. Um, I will not carry a purse. I have never carried a purse. I will never be the kind of woman who carries a purse. And then I started thinking of the, the litany of words that go along with the connotation of purse. So this is called Women Who Carry Purses. Women who carry purses wear blouses, tend their cuticles, collect product and coupons and regenerative cream. Women who carry purses always moisturize, use concealer, eat cake, and say I really shouldn't between bites. <laughs> Women who carry purses use diffusers, curling irons, avoid cheese and carbohydrates. They may be joggers, but they will not run. Some days they might exercise on the elliptical or do a yoga class because they bought the pants. Women who carry purses wear panties and underwires, shoulder pads, pencil skirts, control top pantyhose. Women who carry purses always moisturize and exfoliate. They carry tweezers in their purses. Women who carry purses carry tissues and pocketbooks, carry tampons and tabs of chewing gum, the kind you pop through foil like a pill. Women who carry purses know the difference between heels and pumps and pumps and clogs and clogs and slides. Women who carry purses always sanitize and moisturize, walk to the airport with their pencil skirts and rolling cases, take the escalators, lose their car keys, forget passwords, laugh at men's lame jokes. Women who carry purses don't have satchels slung across their chests, don't fill them with books and water bottles. Women who carry purses don't have messenger bags or backpacks, rarely will ride bicycles, never swim in public, or if they do, they won't get their hair wet. Women who carry purses don't own dot kits or treasure maps, don't track mud across the kitchen floor. Women who carry purses prefer moon roofs to magpies, prefer kitten heels to divas, Teflon to cast iron, peacoats to car hearts. Women who carry purses don't dig or spit, don't pick their scabs or compare calluses, don't fill coat pockets with river rock and dog biscuits, or leave blood on the rose bush or roses on the dash to dry and catch in the wind of open windows. Um, this is something very light and silly, and probably not my finest moment, but it's fun to read. Um, so this is inspired by Jane Hirschfield's uh, Three-Legged Blues, and hers is ever so much better than mine, and um, you should look it up. This is called Home Depot Blues, and I think I started composing this the minute that I, for some reason, bought a house. Home Depot Blues. Twist the spigot. Tap the nozzle, fill the rubber water bottle, shake the smock from spackling, replace outdoor hose o-ring, test the pressure, fill the cup, mud the molding, plug the tub, caulk and solder, measure, measure, don't use sawzalls in all weather, turtle vent and gable roof, retardant is not fireproof, readjust, don't cross the threads or strip the Phillips ratchet heads. Lubricate and insulate. Hire plumbers, don't just wait. Plaster, flashing, putty, and glue. One will not, the other do. I made that mistake. J channel and window headers should be installed by your betters. Mainline fuse box, no your meter. Squirrels will rampage your bird feeder. Set the heater, conserve water. Pay your taxes like you ought. And when the Badger 5 breaks down, please don't flush the coffee grounds. Never sand off lead-based paint. And when in doubt, just use duct tape. And when that breaks, 
I know, it has. Just suck it up and call your dad. <laughs> Um, all right, I am a Persian man here. I'm going to do, um, we'll do two more. Um, this one is called Apocalypse. We set a place for him at the table. A complete set, including soup spoons, even though there is no soup. Dessert, fork, wine glass folded napkin to the left. I eat at the cutting board so as not to seem rude. Apocalypse never calls to cancel. He just doesn't show up. I cooked his favorite, but I have come to understand these invitations. I expect too much. I read into situations just because other people's lives are falling apart. Other people's children kill themselves, or husbands get brain tumors, or breasts get cancer, houses go into foreclosure, hearts fail, or are crushed by failure. Just because he continues to visit all the neighbors, making rounds in seemingly equal yet unpredictable maneuvers, doesn't mean Apocalypse doesn't still love me. I know. He could come any night. I know. I cooked his favorite. Someday, he'll come to eat. And last one. Um, this is another uh, verb poem. Um, peach really should be a verb. Um, it really should. Peach. In the center of the pit of the peach of the moment, when everything feels like it has dropped out of the bottom, or better yet, is dropping, is currently dropping, and will continue to drop as long as we can prevent fear, or better yet, any awareness of a past, a future action, and a consequence from breaking us away from this experience, from the sense of free fall freedom building ever outward in concentric circles of intention and disassociation of us from our own minds, until we find the sweetest moment of, and what else can we call it, but a revelation inside. There's a run of it, a riff of muscle memory, or else some pre-programmed strain of music never practiced, yet quite in the same combination. Some sweet breath of status after the stomach has adjusted to the feeling of free fall. And for this one soft moment, we are preserved in an illusion of our stillness. Sweet, sweet stillness, even as the world swirls by. <laughs> Exhale. This, this is, this is the self that I like best. The one who lives in the center of the pit of the peach of the moment, who doesn't ever say, how come, who dares, where is, or anything besides really, why the hell should we? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much.